When I was younger, I was actually really bad at math. I used to show my math tests and almost get a 60% every single time. So I'm not a math genius at all when you see the title, the math you don't know. However, I was a big fan of Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein was my idol. I used to look into um, astrophysics. I used to love looking at my telescope and staring at the night sky and think about astrophysics. However, in order to be like Albert Einstein, I thought that, oh, probably I had to be very good at math, but then I wasn't. So I looked into a lot of math and did so much math and I still, I still fail my tests. So. so I would say that astrophysics was my spark of inspiration in matters of mathematics. What would you think if someone tells you that, oh, hey, you are a math nerd, you're very good at math. So I would say the first impression that many of you guys have is that you probably got 100% on your math test or perfect SAT math scores or a stack of accolades from your math competitions. So that's the definition of what's good at math. However, if you compare person A, let's say, who got a perfect on his math test to a, another field, another person B who got only one Fields medal, which person would you rather be? Probably person B because there's much greater weight. So I was also stuck on the question of what does being good at math really mean? So then to investigate, I interviewed over 30 mathematicians in North America. And I, I'd like to share three core principles I've learned through my journey with you. And we all say that great, great minds think alike. And today I am excited to see how much we think alike. So um, while I'm speaking, think of three words that comes up in your mind and see how much of a similarity we think. Okay, so number one, math comes from a spark of inspiration. When I interviewed Professor Barry Mazur from Harvard University. Um, I said I was very curious, and so I asked him, what is one magical dose, or what is the ultimate way to make someone very good at math, or what is one integral portion of math education itself? And basically, he said nothing. He didn't say a yes or, or, or drink some orange juice. No, nothing like that, but he actually detailed um, he drew me a scene of one of his colleagues, and so his colleagues uh, wrote numbers one to seven, so one, two, three, one, two, three, four, six, seven, on the blackboard um, in a summer class, which he was teaching um, one of his, which his colleagues was teaching a summer course to younger children. And I was like immediately thinking, well, he probably just made them memorize times tables as I kind of pushed my little brother's head down, making him memorize that one plus one equals to two. But then what actually shocked me was that he made that, his colleague made these little kids, like very young kids, very excited. So everyone spotted that, oh, five was missing from the number list and started to ask questions such as, um, what are negative numbers? Um, what goes after seven? So are numbers infinite or are they finite? These numbers spark children's inspiration and makes us ask questions. So I noticed that, oh, my educational methods were all wrong. I shouldn't probably not make my little brother memorize that one plus one equals a two, but why one plus one equals a two? And that, so overall speaking, math comes from a spark of inspiration, not simply memorizing, but to solicit questions. Okay, number two, math comes from a, a lot of persistence. So 
when I interviewed Professor David Bogan, um, he is, was a former um, president from the AMS, which abbreviates to, abbreviates to um, American Mathematical Society. And what's ironic is that that society gives other people, makes students do competitions, basically. And I asked whether we should make kids do more comp competitive math to label that person as a math nerd. And what he said actually surprised me a lot. And so he basically said that math competitions shouldn't all be the trend. Instead, we should focus on solving the problem the longest instead of spending the shortest time in solving the problem. So I was in shock as in probably math shouldn't be a race at all. We should probably spend the longest time to come up with one original idea. So next time we should have a race between person A and B, spending the longest time solving a math problem. Maybe, maybe person A spends 10 years and person B spends 15 years and so person B wins instead of person A spends 10 seconds and person B spends 15 seconds and person A wins. So probably we should spend the longest time and a lot of persistence when it comes to math problem solving. It's not about who spends the shortest amount of time in solving the problem, but the person who spends the longest time in thinking to come up with one original method of problem solving. And persistence could and grit, of course. We can, we can extend this to um, a broader scale, for example, um, a little personal anecdote. What made me um, get out of my neighborhood of failure in mathematics, so I sucked at math in eighth grade. And so during COVID-19, I didn't have to go to school. And so I spent eight to nine hours on math per day. So I would say that that was one little factor that got me out of the neighborhood of failure in mathematics. Stick to your goals and never give up, and you'll succeed in anything, perhaps one day. Okay, number three, math comes from, being good at math takes a lot of collaboration. And you've probably heard of this many, many times, collaborate with your peers, um, spend time on math problems and ask what this person thinks or other per another person thinks. So I actually had a, a series of, period of time in China taking math classes where more, most people in China actually, um, they sit on the, their little chair and they uh, bury their head um, and then solve problems. But once I came to Canada to solve in, in my math nine class, what surprised me was that the teacher made us, okay, here's a problem and you guys are gonna collaborate and solve. And so I was working with my peers most of the times. And then I was stuck on this geometry problem and I just told my teacher, okay, I'm stuck, tell me the answer. And that teacher was like, no. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he basically said that, well, go and work it out with your peers and see what they've got. And I went to work, out with, work it out with my peers and I found that that simple geometry problem actually had eight ways that you can solve it with. Regardless of whether it's hard or easy, it's all very significant in the problem solving process. So when you're collaborating, you know, we have these whiteboards in the K-8 Canadian school system, how everyone writes on whiteboards. Another little fun trick is that um, it's a way for you to cheat. So when you're writing that, oh, one plus one equals to two, but the other, white, the other group doesn't know what one plus one equals to, like what is that really? And so you can actually take a sneak peek. So it's like a cheat sheet that you can actually, oh, that person that's like, oh, one plus one equals a two, and write it on your board. Or take a look at what other people are thinking. And that's way, that way um, you can basically find a source of inspiration for your thought process as well. 
So when you're collaborating, um, we need a diverse source of ideas to spark something new and interesting. Back in high school, I thought that my ideas were the only ones that mattered. However, they weren't. Other people have their ways of solving problems that were so different than mine. And they were important too. On the same parameters, collaboration can mean we can learn so much from just collaborating. For example, for my podcast, I interviewed Professor Richard Borchards, and he's a field medalist. And what a field medal is specifically is basically the Nobel in math. At first, I was so scared to talk to him or these mathematicians. I thought that maybe mathematicians never laugh, but they actually do. They, they are humans, by the way. And so Richard Borch is a very serious person. He actually talked about his finalization of the monstrous moonshine conjecture in such a joyous tone. And mathematicians are humans and they laugh. Yeah, that's also one portion that I've learned. Collaboration could be key. Every human, every person who's sitting here has an amazing idea. And that's why we share. That's why we go on TED Talks. Today, we're bombarded by millennium problems. There are problems such as the polonial time and non-polonial time, which is P equals to NP. Or maybe they're not equal at all. Who knows? But these are basically the millennium problems that the reason why they call it millennium is that it takes people forever to solve. So, and but mathematicians are collaborating all the time to solve it anyways. But the thing is that on a book that I've read on P equals to MP, um, if P equals to MP, then our world will be an amazing place. If P equals to MP, the problem could be solved by a math amateur, amateur, like a non-professionalist. So could be me, but it has to be someone with one original idea. So next time when you're solving math problems, don't limit yourself on being the person who solves the problem the fastest or competing on accuracy and efficiency, which is what nor we normally talk about. However, we're probably wrong. It's more about originality and creativity. If you have a neighbor who's really bad at math, if you have a student who's really bad at math, if you have a child as a parent who's bad at math, share my stories with them and simply tell them, yes, they can. Thank you.